thì xin nhường lời lại cho MC để điều khiển tiếp chương trình. Xin trân trọng cảm ơn bác sĩ Nguyễn Bá Mỹ Nhi. Mở đầu hội thảo là bài báo cáo với chủ đề Yếu tố nguy cơ kép với ra máu sớm và bệnh sự sĩ thai Làm thế nào để cải thiện khả năng trẻ sinh sống của Phó Giáo sư Bác sĩ Simba Nam Gia Xin mời quý đại biểu chú ý lắng nghe Hello everyone, thank you Uh, Professor Ba Mi Mi and the Vietnam ONG Society for inviting me to talk about this today. I'm really happy to be able to share some of this new evidence that we have. And I'm going to be talking about dual risk factors for early pregnancy bleeding and a history of previous miscarriage. How can we improve the prospect of live birth? Now, we know that miscarriages are something that's very devastating for a couple. And when a couple experience a miscarriage, they feel as if their world has come crashing down. The psychological impact we've seen can be as severe as having a stillbirth at full term, leading to some couples having anxiety, depression, even suicide. And we may not even see all of these effects because they come a bit later. Now for doctors like us who are managing these couples, it can be very frustrating because we feel so helpless because evidence and guidelines don't seem to give us any answers or effective solutions. Mm -hmm. So what I'm gonna hope to do over the next 20 to 30 minutes is to deconstruct the evidence that we do have, use whatever useful information that we can use to manage the heartbroken couple who are sitting in front of us because they're looking to us for answers. So how common are miscarriages? Now, it is probably a lot more common than we realize or that is even reported because there's no, usually no reporting of biochemical pregnancy losses. So we know that that loss can be very high before implantation. But we know that 12 to 15% of women will have one clinical loss after six weeks. If they get to 10 weeks, then that incidence goes down to 3% and about 1% will lose a baby after 16 weeks. So the longer the fetus survives, the less likely a woman is to lose that baby, which tells you a little bit about the fact that maybe it is a baby that's not developing very well to start with. Now, so, but having two miscarriages, we see that only 2% of women have two and less than 1% of women will have three or more miscarriages. So although having a miscarriage is very common, having recurrent miscarriage is not. And that's one of the things we can do to reassure them. And it is common because we know that up to 60% of the karyotype from an abortus is genetically abnormal and morphologically abnormal. Now, Olga Wasara hypothesized that the rate of chromosomal aneuploidies causing miscarriage is constant. And you will see that it's constant no matter how many miscarriages a woman has had. So even you talk about intervention or something that you want to do to prevent a miscarriage, what are you actually trying to prevent? You're not trying to prevent the aneuploid abnormal fetuses from miscarrying, what you're really trying to do is help this group of women who have normal pregnancies, but have lost the baby for some unexplained reason. So even, so this is where trials don't, aren't able to give us the answers that we want. Because let's say you have a very effective drug or a hormone and you treat someone at this point when they've had two previous miscarriages, you'll see that you're going to fail most of the time because you cannot prevent the aneuploid miscarriages. And then you will say that this drug is not very effective. But if you then treat someone who's had four previous miscarriages, then you'll see that for 50% of these women where this is an effective treatment, you'll be successful, but you will still lose 50% of these babies because they're not normal. And if you then treat women who've had six or more miscarriages, then you're going to see that you're really effective at preventing a miscarriages. So this is going to make more sense when I talk about some of the updated results from the PRISM trial. So the question is then, should we test the karyotype of miscarriage tissue for abnormalities? Well, RCOG, Figo, and Eshri all say yes. 
ASRM says it may be useful, but in practice for us, it may be useful just to be able to give the couple an answer to say that, yes, you lost this baby because it wasn't normal, but it's very unlikely to help us in subsequent management as it is not recurrent in most cases. And here's another study from Warburton done in 1987, which shows you that the karyotype of a recurrent miscarriage is most often normal. And even when someone has had a first miscarriage where there's an aneuploidy, they're very, very unlikely to have it happen again. So at this stage, this information is useful for us because we can reassure women. We can tell them that, yes, this is very upsetting that this has happened to you, but chances are it won't happen again. And this is also the opportunity you can use, and you can use this to look at age because age will help to guide what the cause of the miscarriage was. So if you see if women are very young or older, the risk of miscarriage is higher because of aneuploidies and non-disjunction. But if you're between the ages of 20 and 35, then the rate is quite low. And that in itself is reassurance. But this is also an opportunity for us to look at other modifiable lifestyle factors that are associated with miscarriage, like smoking, um, excessive alcohol, excessive caffeine intake, night shift work, environmental toxins, pesticides, high BMI when you go into a pregnancy. But it's important to recognize that these are just factors that they have found that are more common in women who have had miscarriages compared to those who haven't. It's very important to not blame these, these factors for the miscarriage, but use this time to say that let's start changing our lifestyle so that you can be healthier when you start the next pregnancy. Do not assign these factors as causative, but it forms some good practice advice that we can use for them. But you wouldn't investigate anyone at this point if they've had just one miscarriage. So when do you investigate? Now, this is the difficulty because depending on which society it is, there's a different definition for when you investigate and what recurrent miscarriage is. RCOG says three or more consecutive, less than 24 weeks. ASRM says two or more clinical pregnancy losses. ASHRI says two or more. FIGO says they don't even have to be consecutive. But because there are different definitions, different guidance, Different societies will tell you when to investigate and what to look for. But in reality, it's very difficult when we see someone who's at risk of another miscarriage to say that we're not going to do anything at all because they really want to look at us for answers. So what I want to do is propose a common sense sort of approach to investigating. Because what is the goal of investigation really? What you want to do is identify any underlying condition for which there is effective treatment. So if there's no effective treatment, why look for it? And the rationale for most of the societies not recommending investigating earlier is because it's not cost effective. And there's no intervention that has been proven to be useful, like immunotherapy or giving beta HCG or surgery for uterine anomalies. So it doesn't make sense from a cost point of view. But dot investigating doesn't mean not treating. So when do we treat? Now, there are two important determinants for miscarriage in a current pregnancy. That is someone who's got a previous miscarriage and someone who's got early pregnancy bleeding. And progesterone has been given in these two conditions, one as a prevention and one as a rescue. And why is progesterone important? Now, we know very clearly that progesterone is used for establishment and maintenance of pregnancy, not just in the beginning, but all through to the end. Research in 1910 on rabbits showed that if we remove the corpus luteum surgically, it caused a miscarriage. But if you remove the corpus luteum and then give these same rabbits progesterone supplementation, it prolongs it. Now, there was a human study that confirmed the same, but it's very unlikely we can do those kind of studies anymore. It won't get ethical approval. So it's been proposed that a progesterone deficiency or the luteal phase defect is what causes these miscarriages for those who have no other reason. But there's no reliable testing to see who is in this group. 
and 70 years of various different studies, which seem to show that there is some benefit, but no significant um, uh, results on live birth rates, which is the result that these women want. And when you look at all the previous evidence for progesterone, they're all very small studies with less than 150 people in total in each of these studies. They had different um, uh, definitions and different things that they used, different forms of progesterone. And everybody was lumped in one group. And if you look at um, the updated meta-analysis of progesterone, including the ones that came from the two biggest trials, you'll see that everywhere along the way, progesterone seems to be of benefit, but there is no significant finding. And the reason for this is because we are lumping everybody together in one group. And there is no one size fits all model. You cannot treat, use progesterone to treat someone who has an aneuploidy and expect a baby with trisomy 16 to continue developing and grow. You cannot use progesterone when somebody has uncontrolled diabetes. So you cannot use the same treatment for people who have other causes for the miscarriage. And so when you want to look at data that makes sense to treating unexplained miscarriage, you really have to look at data that comes from specialized centers. So women who have been referred to these centers because all of the other causes have been excluded. And the biggest two trials, the PROMISE and the PRISM study come from Ari Kumaraswamy's group, which is the Tommy Center for Miscarriage Research. Now the PROMISE trial is a trial of first trimester progesterone to prevent uh, Re mis recurrent miscarriage, and there were about 800 women in the group. The PRISON trial was first trimester progesterone to treat um, early pregnancy bleeding, and there were over 4,000 women in this group. And the updates, when you look at subgroup analysis for the PROMISE trial, you find that as the number of miscarriages increases, it seems to work better. So this brings us back to the picture I showed you before, which means that when you're giving progesterone to these women, you're more likely to succeed because it is treating some other cause that is causing the miscarriage, probably an issue with either the amount of progesterone or maybe a progesterone resistant. They're not working as well as it should. So giving it seems to help. And this is an update to the PRISM trial. And if you look at the group where women have had more than three miscarriages, then there is statistically significant evidence. But does that mean then that the progesterone type of progesterone matters? Well, the two largest trials which used progesterone and showed that there was safety was vaginal micronized progesterone because this is the progesterone that most closely resembles our natural progesterone that's produced in a woman's body. All the other progesterones, didrogesterone, progesterone, caproate, oral micronized progesterone, they're very small studies. And so we can't really make any conclusions about safety. And when you think about giving these medications in the first trimester, when you know organogenesis is occurring, steroid hormones can affect as well as other things, sexual differentiation. So as far as possible, you want to be able to mimic the kind of progesterone that the body produces. And this is hot off the presses, is a Cochrane review of all the different progesterones given for preventing miscarriage. And you will see that for threatened miscarriage and recurrent miscarriage, the largest studies which showed an effect, at least in higher order recurrence, is vaginal micronized progesterone. Oral didrogesterone was watched just one study in over 400 women for threatened miscarriage. And oral didrogesterone for recurrent miscarriage came actually from a very low quality study um, with not much randomization. So the overall conclusion from that is that vaginal micronized progesterone may increase the live birth rate for women with a history of one or previous miscarriages and early pregnancy bleeding with likely no difference in adverse events. But there is still uncertainty about the effectiveness and safety of alternative progesterone treatments. And didrogesterone is not licensed in either the UK or the US. There's also some concern that it could cause congenital heart disease. 
in early pregnancy. So what does that mean for us in practice? Does it mean we have to wait for someone to have more than four miscarriages before we treat them? No. What it means is that we have the potential to treat someone even earlier with the premise that you explain to them that this progesterone supplementation, this vaginal progesterone supplementation may help to prolong your pregnancy and give you a live birth if your pregnancy is Unex if, the, if the miscarriage is unexplained, but it will not prolong a pregnancy for a baby that is not. And if they understand that, we know that it is safe to continue vaginal progesterone and, there's no, and it's better than doing nothing at all. But what about whether we screen for other causes? When do we do that? It's when it's clinically indicated. Now, we haven't done nothing after someone has had one or two miscarriages. What we've done is made a mental checklist of all the other possible causes based on the history that she's given us. So what are the other purported causes of euploid causes of miscarriages? Now there are single gene or polygenic abnormalities which call morphological abnormalities and that we may not be able to prevent, but this also may cause later miscarriages, not so early. Hormonal issues, so diabetes and thyroid dysfunction specifically. So uncontrolled diabetes or hypothyroidism, this can very easily be um, excluded if patients have symptoms and with a blood test. Antiphospholipid syndrome is responsible for 15 to 20% of women who have recurrent miscarriages. And this also is guided by history. You wouldn't screen everyone with a recurrent miscarriage for this you will have to specifically have these criteria. Either it's one miscarriage more than 10 weeks of a morphologically normal fetus, a history of preterm birth or preeclampsia before 34 weeks, or three or more uh, first trimester miscarriages. And it's a similar criteria for looking for thrombophilia. Uterine anomalies may cause um, recurrent miscarriages, but normally not very early. This is the later mid-trimester losses. Lyomyomas um, have been um, suggested as a cause. Immunologic phenomena. So just the fact that the body is rejecting this baby, but unfortunately not very much we can do about it. Infection and vaginal microbiome. Now this is gaining a lot of interest. And the fact that we can possibly improve the, the good probiotics in the woman by replacing her lactobacilli is gaining a lot of traction, but certainly not enough to guide um, treatment for now. Toxic exposure and psychological stress. And what is the evidence for all of these other causes? Now, diabetes mellitus, if you find that her HbA1c is more than four standard deviations, then yes, you can consider that a cause of her miscarriage. But if it's a well-controlled diabetes, the answer is no. And if someone has got thyroid dysfunction, if you've just done a random thyroid function test, you wouldn't treat a subclinical hypothyroidism unless the TSH was going to more than four milli international units per liter. What about surgical correction for uterine anomalies? Now, as you remember, I said this is usually what causes mid-trimester losses. If you look at the general population, 4% will have a uterine anomaly, but in the group of women who have recurrent miscarriages, this is up to 13%. So that's how they've related this as a cause. It's most plausible after 10 weeks and it's morphological normal. The types of treatments suggested, perceptive uterus, yes, most plausible because there is something you can do about it without really compromising the integrity of the uterus. But for biconuate and arcuate uterus, it's not recommended at all. What do the society says? RCOG says no, because no RCTs have been conducted. ASRM says it should be considered. Escher says more clinical trials are warranted. Bigo says, consider it for a septate uterus, especially if the prior losses are consistently more than 10 weeks and the embryos are normal, but otherwise no. What about antiphospholipid syndrome? What is the laboratory criteria that we will need to confirm that someone has this? So it's lupus anticoagulant present two more times 12 weeks apart, anticardiolipin IgG or IgM, or anti-beta-2 glycoprotein-1 or beta-2 glycoprotein-1 antibody or IgM isotope twice and 12 weeks apart. 
because we know that if somebody has antiphospholipid syndrome, this study um, showed that aspirin alone showed no difference in reducing the miscarriage rate, but heparin plus aspirin together reduced the miscarriage risk by more than 60%. But if you use prednisolone and aspirin, although it reduced it slightly by 15%, it increased the rate of prematurity, so it's not recommended. So antiphospholipid treatments, everyone says yes, yes, yes to heparin and aspirin. Low dose versus high dose, the only one that um, addresses it is RCOG. No to corticosteroids, no to immunoglobulins because no evidence that it works. What about inherited thrombophilia? Now the RCOG says yes to screen, but no to treat. And all of the others says don't bother screening at all because you're not going to treat. So the take home message from all of this is that the management of women with previous miscarriage starts from the first visit. Reassurance, especially if it's only one, identify risk factors at this point, lifestyle modification if applicable. Vaginal micronized progesterone is safe and appears to be useful in prolonging pregnancy, especially in those who have threatened and recurrent miscarriages. Screen for other causes if the history or examination points to other treatable consequence and do not underestimate the effect of tender loving care because how we are with them can really help in making them feel better. Thank you very much. Xin cảm ơn phần thông tin khoa học từ bài trình bày của phó giáo sư. Thanks for the first speaker presentation continuing the program. Let's listen to the to Dr. Nguyễn Bá Minh Nhi, director of OBGYN Center Prophylaxis for preterm birth among women with high risk factors. We have heard a very interesting lecture about recurrent miscarriage. I'm sure that there would be a lot of questions going to Dr. Shupa Nambia. I would like to talk about prophylaxis and preventions against preterm birth among women with high risk factors. World Health Organization has given us return birth is before 37 weeks, extremely return before 28 weeks, very return 28 and 32 weeks, moderate to late return 32 to 37 weeks. So births at 37 to 39 weeks have a suboptimal outcomes. And most of the organization and societies say that we shouldn't perform surgical delivery or inductions before 39 weeks, unless it is indicated and medically. So let's focus on the time frame before 37 weeks globally. Return birth happens uh, everywhere. Looking at this uh, global picture, the darker the color, the higher return birth. For example, the black continent, and some other countries in Asia. Every year, about 15 million preterm babies, it seems to be increasing. It is related to IVF program. Multiple pregnancies happen more often. And every year about 1 million 
preterm babies die because of complications. Preterm birth account for five to eighteen percent. Vietnam ranking about nine percent, more than eighty percent of preterm birth between thirty-two to thirty-seven weeks, and most are viable if they receive neonatal ICU and other care, proper care. Return birth in Vietnam, as I have told you, 9.4%, and we rank about 103 position in the world. Global average is about 11%. Most of return birth babies are vulnerable. They need to return to hospital quite soon because of complications. And we need to check the chance of readmission is quite high. For example, children die due to AIDS or malaria or diarrhea is still lower than mortality rate caused by return birth. In high-income countries, 10% of these baby die. In poorer countries, they are much more unfortunate. 90% of them would die. Therefore, we need to have intensive care cooperations between pediatrics and obstetrics. The mortality rate is higher when children are more preterm. Looking at this graph, the more premature, the higher mortality. The chance of living is very low. After 39 weeks, live birth rate would increase. 50% of perinatal mortality is associated to premature birth directly or indirectly, might be increasing infections, return birth associated with the malnutrition, poor vision, hearing, infections, respiratory failure, surfactant disease. We need to screen for these uh, complications. These uh, children, as I have uh, told you, have a more respiratory problem, problems with psychomotor development, and they may carry cerebral palsy, poorer quality of life. There are some risk factors from mothers maternal risk factors, acute disease from women, such as uh, high fever, acute uh, appendicitis, urinary infections, periodontitis, women with chronic diseases, hypertension, diabetes, which is uncontrolled, uncontrolled hypertension, chronic kidney disease, renal failure, together with preeclampsia. Among women with a history of preterm birth, this is a strong risk factor. Vaginal bleeding during pregnancy, uterine abnormality, fibrosis, and in particular, short cervix. Cervix cervical length is an important prognostic factor regarding preterm birth. Among these factors, we need to pay attention to history of preterm birth and cervical length. Besides, there are some other factors such as colonization due to uterine malignancy, genetic factors, lifestyle, 
and other habitual routines. Smoking, excessive physical activity. And how about fetal risk factors? Multiple pregnancy is a leading risk factor or assisted reproductive technology and IVF, even for singleton. Infected amniotic fluid, be from ab abnormal fetal uh, placenta previa and polyhyramnios. So we face uh, risk factors. We face uh, vulnerable factors for return birth. So what should be done for uh, as for a strategy to prevent return birth? In 2019, There is a call for actions, there are two global strategy. But first of all, we need to carry out return birth preventions. And secondly, reducing mortality among return birth in international guidelines and society. Number one, we need to know prognosticator the return birth profile, and if return birth already happened, how to decrease it. The annual clinical and scientific meeting of ACOG was organized in Austin, Texas in 2018. Dr. Riggers said that return birth is the largest single cause of infant death in America and the leading cause of neurological defects among babies. And the best way to handle it is return birth prevention. Once again, we need return birth prevention to prevent to avoid return babies with very poor prognosis. So how to do prophylaxis, there are two major risk factors, one from mother and one from children. As for mothers, history of preterm birth, of course, we have to get a detailed history. And secondly, we need to measure the cervical length objectively to know whether that woman would go down the track of return birth, cervical length and fetal fibronectin measurement. Cervical length need to be measured outside the con contractions between 19 weeks to 24 weeks or earlier. The cutoff threshold is at 25 millimeter. As I have told you, fetal fibronectin fetal fibronectin is produced at the adjacent interface between the fetal membrane and the maternal membrane. The threshold is a 50 nanogram per million. If it is much more than that, there's a chance of preterm birth. However, because of the cost and availability and guideline, fetal fibronectin has not been widely applicable. So we need to focus on cervical length at this moment. This is uh, the strongest independent risk factors be considered as a gold standard. And we can avoid the directions of the cervix overshadowing of the fetus and obese swimming. Transvaginal sonography is considered as a gold standard. 
we need to measure at the time without uterine contractions to evaluate the risk factor due to short service routinely. Week 19 to week 23, or in women with a preterm birth history, we may do it earlier between week 14 to week 16 for those who already have uterine contractions. We can prognosticate the progress of preterm birth within seven days. So how can we de define short cervix? Most of the big organizations without risk factors, no preterm birth history, no late term, no multiple pregnancy and so on. So cervical length less than 20 millimeter Return birth history less than 25, twins less than 25, and triplets less than 25. So I'm sure that everybody should remember the threshold, the cutoff level of 25 millimeter. Vietnam Association of Gynecology and Obstetrics and International Societies in the World. What do they say? Figo and CC message and recommendations when it is mandatory to conduct a transvaginal ultrasound to measure cervical length between week 19 and week 23. It needs to be done. In Vietnam right now, it has been done routinely. And if cervical length is less than 25 millimeter, it is indicated to be to use a 200 milligram vaginal soft capsule or 90 milligram vaginal gel of micronized progesterone at the time of the diagnosis until week 36. So we have been doing it routinely. And how about from Europe? s -ray also talk about return birth and prophylaxis with progesterone. When they have a previous history of return birth, short cervical length less than 25 millimeter, multiple pregnancy, twins, and short service. This is a recommendation from Europe. In 2017, they also underscore another problem between micronized vaginal, progesterone, and 17 hydroxy caproat. Caproat progesterone 17 is not recommended because it may lead to gestational diabetes. So once again, return birth history, short service, twins and short service. It should be a good idea to use vaginal micronized progesterone. So for women who is single, what should we should know when and how often should cervical length be conducted, be measured. There are three scenarios. Measured for those who are single time without history of preterm birth, single time or twins, just one time at week 20. 
among those women. If cervix is more than 25 millimeters, so just a standard can. No need to do further examination or interventions. However, if it is less than 25 millimeter, then progesterone is indicated every day until week 36. There's no need to make another measurement. If the first measurement is already 25 millimeter, and the latest recommendation is once again, micronized vaginal progesterone. Let's take a look at the second scenario, single ton, return birth history, spontaneous return birth, when gestational age between 14 and 27 weeks, sonographic measurement of cervical length at 14 weeks, If the service is longer than 30 millimeter, we need to repeat sonographic measurement every two weeks. This is serial son sonography until 24 weeks. If the cervix is not getting shorter and shorter, it is still more than 30 millimeter at week 24, then just keep going. No further attention or intervention is needed. However, if it is less than 30 millimeter, for example, between 26 and 29, we need to carry out some intervention. Less than 25, we need to do surclage and continue with progesterone and zero sonography until week 24, between the range of 26 to 29, then progesterone or surclage. So at the end of the, now let's take a look at the last scenario, single ton return birth history. At week 16 and follow on the algorithm similarly to the second scenario, starting to use progesterone between week 16 until week 36 can reduce a recurrent miscarriage and return birth. Nice. In August 2019, recommendation is as follows. Progesterone vaginal implantation or circlage. Progesterone vaginally implanted when there is history of return birth, short cervix less than 25, between week 16 and week 24, until at least week 34. Those are hormonal recommendations from NICE. How about circlage? Short cervix. Together with history of preterm birth, history of B-prom or cervical trauma. Then circlage should be indicated and we have to have a plan to make sure the suture should be removed when needed. According to the Australia and New Zealand, progesterone in women asymptomatic and short service. This recommendation is quite new. Progesterone should be considered for women with single ton and history of Britain Burton, single ton. In Vietnam, similarly, 
We also measure cervical length trends vaginally. Week 19 to week 23, progesterone vaginally implanted when cervical length is less than 25 millimeter. It is as good as circlage. Progesterone vaginally 200 milligram micronized on gel until rupture of the membrane. So recommendations from big organizations. We have a different solution, progesterone circlage, and another one, pessary. So what is progesterone? Don't forget that there is a seesaw theory during pregnancy. This is a balance. On the one hand, there is progesterone, and on the other hand, there is prostaglandin or cytosin. If it is in favor of prostaglandin, progesterone would go down. If progesterone in a serum going down, that is the first factor to trigger labor. The mechanisms of progesterone at four positions, blood center. Blood center help to regulate the time of labor. Secondly, in the amniotic fluid, it can delay the production of prostaglandin. Prostaglandin is a trigger factor for labor. Amniotic membrane inhibition of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And besides, there is also anti-inflammatory at the uterine muscle and, and the cervix. What is the efficacy of vaginal progesterone for a singleton and short cervix? I'm sure that you are familiar with the name of Roberto Romero. He has quite a few articles regarding return birth and prevention in a meter analysis in 2018. He talked about vaginal progesterone to prevent return birth and to outcome perinatal outcomes. When we compare the relative risk factors, this graph is in favor of vaginal progesterone. Relative risk is at 0 0.62, so 38% reduction for twins and short service. The same author in 2017 once again confirmed that for twin short cervix, vaginal progesterone also does a good job. The relative risk is 0 0.69, 31% reduction, has no impact on psychomotor development. In the peer review journal, The Lancet update, 2021, the conclusion is that vaginal progesterone enjoy 22% reduction of relative risk compared to 17 hydroxy progesterone caprate. Oral progesterone does not have enough data and evidence to be evaluated especially in terms of efficacy and safety. There's one study, follow-up baby, after the use received progesterone. The conclusion in 2015 saying that there's no evidence of negative impact on physical, psychosocial and motor development 
are three to six years old, when their mom, their pregnant mom, use progesterone. In optimum study, this is a multi-center study. Once again, vaginal progesterone has no negative impact on children until two years old. Let's take a look at this slide. Reducing 30% of respiratory distress, less than 47% of low birth weight, mechanical ventilations, and mortality, which is uh, comparable to clinical data trial of Roberto Romero. So natural micronized progesterone really does its jobs. Let's take a look at this slide. By using progesterone vaginally implanted versus placebo, Mort neonatal mortality reducing five times and brain injury less than twice. We have seen quite a lot of evidence of vaginal progesterone. According to Canada Association, it is recommended to use a progesterone vaginally implanted for a single ton and multiple pregnancy. Do not use a progesterone intramuscularly because of uh, a negative impact among neonatal. And as for a single ton, brief history of preterm birth or short cervix, progesterone vaginal is also indicated between week 16 and week 24 and can be continued until week 34, week 36. Progesterone road has been demonstrated. Let's take a look at surplage. What is the role of surplage in 2012, according to ASRIM? Surplage can be considered if cervical length is shorter than 25 millimeters before 24 weeks. Surplage, rescue surplage or emergency surplage, there must be some conditions. It can prolong pregnancy and increase a live birth weight. Amniotic fluid must be still there. No uterine contraction, no infections, no labor. However, this is a quite difficult technique and not every obstetrician can do that. And there might be a high chance of rupture of the membrane. This is a consensus statement between these two society. Rescue surplage, according to NICE, Updated in August 2019, not indicated when there is infection or vaginal bleeding or uterine contraction. We should consider week 16 and 27. There need to be cooperation between obstetrics and neonatal pediatrics. According to NICE, they mentioned the time point of week 20, 27. We need to explain on the risks and benefit to women and their families. We want to delay the birth and increase the chance of baby survival and reducing neonatal morbidity. We need to make sure that the future should be removed, otherwise 
the cervix can be destroyed. Another piece of treatment is pessary. In some literature from ACOG in 2018, it has been demonstrated that there's no difference for pregnancy younger than 34 weeks versus the group receiving progesterone. Beside pessary may lead to vaginal discharge and irritation and discomfort. Difficult for peeing, for urinations. It has been found that using pessary to reduce a preterm birth less than 34 weeks does not decrease the preterm birth among gestational age less than 34 weeks when they show a service. There's no difference. Less than 34 weeks. Early applications for short service like progesterone vaginally implanted or surclage, pessary does not make a superiority compared to the other two options. However, pessary can reduce significantly the spontaneous preterm birth less than 37 weeks among women with history of preterm birth and PPROM. I mean that pessary can delay the childbirth a little bit better. Currently, pessary, we know that it is there, it is available. It changed the axis of the cervix. It is usually used for people with the prolapse, organ prolapse, and for conditions that we cannot perform surclage according to NICE guideline. In 2016, there's no big meta-analysis or conclusion regarding pessary and how about combinations between pessary and progesterone. This combination has been studied in 2018. Vaginal progesterone and cervical pessary when they combine to prevent return birth in women with short cervix is safe and has good tolerance. We can prolong pregnancy, reduce the breath, return birth, and lower rate of perinatal complications. When we combine those methods, let's take a look at the statement from HR. For people with a very short cervix, 25 millimeter is the threshold. Extreme short surface is less than 10 or 15 millimeter. We can combine surclage and vaginal progesterone. It can prolong pregnancy latency by twofold. and decrease the neonatal morbidity and mortality. So in conclusion, we know that return birth is a very big problem in obstetrics. The major strategy to reduce return birth is good prophylaxis and prevention. We need to know the status of the service, history of return birth, 
Therefore, cervical sonography is mandatory. Progesterone with and without surplus or pessary is effective. Among pregnant women with short service or preterm birth history, it is recommended to use micronized vaginal progesterone 200 to 400 milligrams per day until week 36. However, prevention is not always successful. Sometimes we may suffer from failure. We can prolong from week 28 to week 32, supposing they still preterm labor. So what should be done? In 2015, WHO has recommended some measure to improve the prognosis of preterm children. We need to provide tocolytic agents to delay preterm labor. Magnesium sulfate to protect the brain. Corticosteroid and antibiotics. WHO has recommended interventions to improve the prognosis, especially for those with preterm birth at less than 32 weeks to prevent cerebral palsy. This is an image of an older child totally dependent on others. There is problem with leukomalacia, cerebral hemorrhage, leading to neurological defects. Therefore, it is mandatory to have the screening, assessment, evaluation, and prevention to reduce the prevalence and severity of cerebral palsy. What are neurological protection mechanisms of sulfate magnesium? Many me mechanisms have been listed. Antioxidant, reductions of pro-inflammatory cytokines, inhibitions of calcium ion, improvement of the cellular membrane integrity, more cerebral blood perfusions and stabilizing blood pressure. So we can avoid the image. This is a boy totally dependent on others. In other countries, the man best friend is a dog. from Vietnam Association of Gynecology and Obstetrics. He has some recommendations. Magnesium sulfate is recommended and indicated for babies under 32 weeks. For surgical delivery, sulfate magnesium need to be given at least four hours before delivery. That Sulfate magnesium can protect the brain regardless of the number of pregnancy, the reason of preterm birth. So for gestation between 28 to 32 weeks and the imminent preterm birth, contraindications, cervical, cervix already open more than eight centimeter, expected to deliver within two hours for those with the history of hypertension or preeclampsia. 
from my hospital, sulfate magnesium, 4.5 grams, single dose, intravenous. You may see other regimens, 4 grams intravenous bolus and 1 gram every hour until delivery and so on. Of course, you need to monitor the vital signs such as a preeclampsia and a clamsia. As for corticosteroid, the consensus is that corticosteroid should be given. It can reduce mortality, respiratory distress, and cerebral hemorrhage before week 34. Corticosteroid such as beta metazone. According to American guidelines, for children between 28 to 36 weeks, the second dose can be given. If no corticosteroid has been given before week 34, Week 26 to week 34, one dose. Contraindications when we cannot delay labor within 48 hours, or the ratio between lecithin and sphingomyelin is more than two. We may use beta metazone 12 milligram intramuscularly, two doses with the interval 24 hours. So besides sulfate, magnesium, antibiotics, corticosteroid, we also need to deliver tocolytic agents. In terms of tocolytic agents, there's a quite variety, nifedipine, atosiban, beta blocker, and so on, depending on the cervical status, threaten return birth, availability and experience of the facility. We may choose the proper medicine to deliver. For effective medications, the children, the baby can buy, we can buy some more time for the baby to enjoy the benefit of sulfate magnesium and corticosteroid for better lung maturity. But just run can reduce the uterine contraction. Progesterone can do a good job in this aspect. Vaginal micronized progesterone is studied in this study. People with the signs and signals of threatened return birth. Two capsules of utrogestin, 200 milligrams within 48 hours after the contractions. For micronized progesterone, it can reduce the propagation velocity of electrical signals within the uterine muscle, and it is associated with a transfer toward lower uterine electrical signal frequency. So micronized vaginal progesterone does a good job. So for threatened preterm labor, Micronized progesterone, vaginal progesterone is the way to go. Antibiotic can be given. It is not indicated when there's no signs of infection or the rub on the membrane is still intact. Erythromycin is recommended. Do not use uh, amoxicillin and clavulanic acid for those with rupture of the membrane. 
you know that the augmentin, amoxicillin, and glavulanic acid may lead to necrosis, intestinal necrosis among the babies. So the second conclusion, when we receive a pregnant woman with threatened preterm labor, we need to assess tocolytic agents, corticosteroid. We need to provide magnesium sulfate to protect the brain. If we anticipate preterm labor within 24 hours, by doing so, we can protect the brain of the baby. Prophylactic antibiotics, when there is a rupture of the membrane, and don't forget to alert the pediatricians for better cooperations between obstetric and ped pediatrics. So at that time, we may have a kind of a hospital or department transfer while the baby is still in the womb to make sure that the baby can be supported in a neonatal ICU. I have uh, talked to you about preterm labor preventions, and if preterm labor does happen, if when it is inevitable, what should be done? This is the end of my lecture. I would like to thank you so much for your attentive listening. We expect that uh, there would be no more babies who should be on the wheelchair for the whole of their life and have to be dependent with others. We need to know that today we do a good job and tomorrow we should do a better job and better and better to prevent such a circumstances of babies who have to depend on people for the rest of their lives. Many thanks for your attentive listening. Many thanks to the second speaker. The second speaker lecture has finished on the academic presentations. And now we come to the Q&A. Today we have two panelists, Professor Shipa Nambia and Dr. Nguyen Ba Minyi. You can raise the questions by sending the question to the Q&A chat box. Right after this, the podium is open. We would like to invite back to the stage Dr. Nhi and Dr. Shupa Nambia. Ladies and gentlemen, we have heard two lectures related to recurrent miscarriage and return birth. I'm waiting for questions from everybody. You can share your clinical experience, knowledge, updates, and send us the questions so that we can handle all of the questions involved from the participants. Thank you. Actually, we had some good questions in the chat box earlier, which I think I want to bring up again because um, I think it will be useful for everyone. Um, could I just share one of my slides, please, so that I can explain the concept again? Yes, Dr. Simba, you can share the slide. Okay. So I had some very good questions because we were talking about the PRISM and the PROMISE trials where it said that the progesterone supplementation or the vaginal progesterone only seems to work when women have had more than three or four and actually more significant when it's like five or six. So the questions that I was asked is one, what will you do in your practice if you've seen someone with just one recurrent or two recurrent miscarriage, miscarriages? And two, if the evidence only shows that it works for those who've had more than three miscarriages, why do you, why do you treat if it's any earlier? So before I answer those two questions, I just wanna show you this slide again, because what it shows is that the rate of 
aneuploidy causing miscarriage. So abnormal genetically baby is constant no matter how many miscarriages a woman has. So whether she's had two recurrent miscarriages, three recurrent miscarriages, there's going to be a proportion of women who lose their babies because the baby is not normal, right? So when you're seeing a woman who's got pregnancy bleeding or even one previous miscarriage, of course, you're not going to say, I can't do anything for you because the, the evidence only shows what it shows because of this. So if I treat someone who's only had two miscarriages before with progesterone, and we know now that progesterone seems to be effective, even though it's only two miscarriages, you find that I may be successful in prolonging the pregnancy for this small group of women, but I still will fail when the pregnancy is not normal. So that's why I say that, yes, you can still give her progesterone, but you must explain that it will not prolong a, an abnormal pregnancy. And then if you treat someone who's had four previous miscarriages, so this is when the studies start to show that there is effect. And the reason for this is, if she's had so many miscarriages, chances are it's not just the fact that the baby is abnormal that's a problem, she's got something else going on that we can treat. So in this group of women, in 50%, we will manage to prolong the pregnancy, but in another 50%, we won't. So it's not to say that progesterone is only 50% effective. Progesterone is only effective in prolonging a pregnancy that is normal. And if you look at this, if we treat all women who've had six previous miscarriages, Yes, these women who've had still an abnormal baby will lose that baby, but a majority of them for which it will work. So then the question is, when do you treat or when do I treat? So I will treat even here. But at this point, I will say, I cannot save a baby that's abnormal. So progesterone can help if this baby is abnormal because it may be just an issue of the fact that you either don't have enough progesterone or the progesterone that you have isn't working at the receptors, but supplementing you in studies seems to work. So that's the simple answer. I will treat as soon as I see them. If they've even got one risk factor of bleeding or one previous miscarriage, I will treat. Unless of course the history suggests she's got some other abnormality like diabetes or antiphospholipid syndrome or something else. I have seen some questions. I would like to share with you some of the questions. Dạ, bác sĩ Mỹ Nhi cứ đọc câu hỏi trên màn hình. Tất cả câu hỏi tụi em đang nhập dần phía sau để đưa lên màn hình cho bác sĩ dễ theo dõi. There's one question regarding antibiotics, corticosteroid. We know that antibiotics for preterm birth, according to WHO, we shouldn't use our augmentin. The chance of necrotizing enterocolitis is there. By using augmentin, it would increase the chance of an necrotizing enterocolitis. We should use other groups of antibiotics, such as erythromycin, ampicillin. As for corticosteroid, for a single ton or twin, the same dose is recommended. There's another question.
is the ratio between lecithin and sphingomyelin available and feasible in Vietnam? It has been done in Vietnam. But, but lecithin and sphingomyelin, we need to perform amniosynthesis. So many doctors are reluctant to do that. And it is not done routinely. Another question. Uh, how should we treat threatened preterm labor for women with history of preeclampsia? Priority is given to the pregnant women or severe preeclampsia. When it is in labor, we need to support the lung, protect the brain, take the baby out to terminate pregnancy. Therefore, for preeclampsia, we need to assess into scenario whether it is severe preeclampsia or asymptomatic. For severe preeclampsia, it is mandatory to terminate pregnancy. And if it goes into labor, we support the lung, the brain, and then end the, the pregnancy. Can we combine dufastum orally and progesterone vaginally? Currently, there's no clinical trial regarding this combination. Some other clinical trial combine 17 hydroxy caproate and vaginal progesterone or oral dirogesterone as for treatment of preterm birth. We only use a hormonal solution and a mechanical solution, for example, pessary and progesterone, like micronized vaginal progesterone. There's one other question. Corticosteroid for pregnant women. Is it routinely indicated for women who expect to deliver within seven days? Corticosteroid may lead to higher blood sugar level. in women, if we use corticosteroid for gestation less than 34 weeks and expect it to be delivered within seven days. If you can have the accurate gestational age and less than 34 weeks, it is compulsory to administer corticosteroid and most of the big organization in the world have recommended to use corticosteroid. There's no contraindications to that. A transient elevated blood sugar is not a big concern. And there's no evidence showing that corticosteroid can delay the fetal growth. Some authors do not agree with routinely administer corticosteroid. If we abuse a corticosteroid, it may lead to negative impact on the fetal brain for example, cognitive function in the future going down the track. They may suffer from speech disorders. Therefore, it is not ever recommended to prescribe corticosteroid routinely. Only applicable for the above circumstances, as I have mentioned. 
Therefore, as you can see, in order to improve the perinatal outcome, we need to slow, we need to terminate the uterine contraction with tocolytic agents. Some doctors are worried when they do IVF and it is quite difficult to get pregnant and they are afraid that if we, we just give a, a vaginal progesterone only and should they should corticosteroid be given most of the experts agree that we should not abuse a corticosteroid we should consider case by case I think that in your scenario, the benefits are outweigh the risks and corticosteroids should be given. Um, the next questions. how to use uh, tocolytic agents by using meloxicam. Is it legal to use that? There are different agents for tocolysis. For example, nifidipine, uh, anti-hypertension, calcium channel blocker. But now it has been recommended. Previously, we use it as off-label purpose or magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate is given for threatened return labor, mainly for preeclampsia. Molossicam is in a similar situation. Beta emetics, nifedipine, and meloxicam. In Vietnam currently, meloxicam is there but it is still quite expensive. There is kind of a, a synchrony effect by using progesterone together with nifedipine. Malosicam is not recommended in the national standard. There's another question. What is the dose of nifedipine? and what to do when there is an overdose of sulfate, magnesium. If there's a loss of muscular tendon reflex, we need to use a calcium chloride intravenously to counteract the effect of magnesium sulfate. And we should measure the serum level of uh, magnesium sulfate the recommended dose of nifedipine. There's a loading dose and maintenance dose. You may read more on that on the national recommendations. Or you can read from the guideline up to your hospital. There's one more question. If we need to use corticosteroid the second time, so how soon after the first time can we use it? Are there any side effects? If you read the literature regarding respiratory support for preterm birth, only ASRIM recommends that we can use a corticosteroid to week 36. Currently, we do not repeat the second dose of corticosteroid at week 34, one more dose. For example, somebody with threatened preterm labor, corticosteroid expected to deliver within one week and then two weeks later, not deliver yet. In America, the SRM say that you may consider another dose of corticosteroid. After 14 days, after the first dose, for people with late 
return delivery. 34, 35 weeks. We may give one dose of corticosteroid at the time of delivery between week 34 to 36 weeks. According to ICOG, if you deliver surgically before week 38, it is recommended to use one dose of corticosteroid. Those are some of the information from different international guidelines. As for SRM, they recommend they, that you can consider corticosteroid the second dose after 14 days after the first dose. Another question regarding sulfate, magnesium to reduce cerebral palsy for newborns. In my lecture, we know that less than 32 weeks, the chance of cerebral palsy is very high. 80 to 90% may suffer from cerebral palsy. 32 to 38 weeks, 50 to 60% of likelihood of cerebral palsy. So for preterm birth before 32 weeks, some recommendations saying that before 34 weeks, magnesium sulfate should be given to prevent cerebral palsy. Another doctor raising another question. For women after colonization, for women after cervical colonization, there is a risk factor of preterm birth. In my personal opinion, you need to measure the cervical length. Week 19 to week 23, however, there's no clinical trial saying the uh, rate or the percentage of preterm birth after cervical colonizations. As far as I know, for a short cervical length, then we can recommend surclage because the cervix has lost a big chunk of it. And if the internal os is open, when to perform suturing of the isthmus and percentage of return birth or miscarriage. Until now, there's no official guidance or epidemiology or statistic on that. I think that if cervical length is shorter than progesterone vaginally and also suturing should be applicable. There's another question. Corticosteroid for threatened a preterm birth in women with diabetes, gestational diabetes. Currently, when you deliver corticosteroid, blood sugar may be elevated a little bit, but it's not a contraindication to corticosteroid. For gestational diabetes, you, you can carry out dietary modifications, insulin, yes. corticosteroid, uh, just delivered within one or two days. So there's no big concern. Như vậy thì chắc bác sĩ Shiba có những cái câu hỏi của các đồng nghiệp đặt ra đó chỉ chắc xin And some questions for Dr. Shiba. Dr. Shiba Nambia, now it's your turn now. Uh, 
Yes, what's the question? I'm sorry, I can't read. Oh, okay, repeating the questions. For, re for recurrent pregnancy loss due oh. to antiphospholipid syndrome, what do you think about the use of folic acid? Okay. Um, if we've diagnosed that she definitely has antiphospholipid syndrome, um, then we know that um, heparin and aspirin is what's most effective at reducing a subsequent miscarriage. But folic acid, of course, is important anyway. I mean, you need to give folic acid whether or not they have APS. And, but folic acid is really important for neural tube defects up to 12 weeks from before pregnancy up to 12 weeks. After that, if you want to add it, you can. I don't think it adds anything to the treatment for the recurrent miscarriage, but there's no harm. Okay, so several studies indicate that patients um, with a just in their early gestation with bleeding and low serum progesterone, so cut off 30 nanogram per milliliter, had most benefit from progesterone therapy, while those with the same clinical system, so bleeding, but normal serum progesterone showed no improvement in miscarriage prevention. Do you have any comment? Okay, well, the cutoff for 30 nanogram per milliliter for progesterone really is from the guideline looking uh, of um, management of pregnancy of unknown location. So what 30 nanogram per milliliter tells me is that this is an unhealthy pregnancy to start with. It may not be that the progesterone is low and that's why they're having the miscarriage. The progesterone is low because it's an abnormal pregnancy. And so these are the pregnancies, no matter what you do, may not survive anyway. So, um, it's very difficult because you're still treating at a stage where we don't know where the normal and where the abnormal is. If the progesterone were likely to continue on that pregnancy, then chances are this was a normal uh, pregnancy to start with. And the second part is in IVF, transfer of euploid embryos and routine supply of progesterone until eight to 10 weeks, why can we still not prevent early miscarriage? Now, when you do PGD, you're not looking for everything. You're looking for some of the abnormalities, but not everything. So there are also some embryos which don't have um, specific aneuploidies like trisomy 21 or 18 or 13, but some unclassified trisomies. Some of them are single gene abnormalities. They're responsible for structural abnormalities. Now, these babies are similarly unhealthy and may not survive anyway. So giving progesterone to this group of women won't work. But if you're giving progesterone to women who still have euploid, and we cannot always confirm that everyone is euploid, likely will work based on the evidence that we can see now. Looking at PRISM and PROMISE, there's no statistical significance in terms of live birth by giving vaginal micronized progesterone, but only in those with three or more history of miscarriage. So is it justifiable to treat those with not more than three miscarriages? So I go back to the slide that I showed you. The reason it seems to work when people have had more miscarriages is not because you have to have three miscarriages or four miscarriages before the progesterone can work. It's just that it's showing you that women who've had re recurrent previous miscarriages probably have something that can be corrected. So I'm because the evidence shows us this, it doesn't mean that this is what we, are, we have to do in practice. We are not conducting trials ourselves. So when you treat someone earlier, like I said, you may treat someone with maybe two miscarriages or three miscarriages. You will still be able to treat those whose pregnancies are normal, but you will still fail if it's abnormal. So I ask you back this question. Are you going to say, if someone has had only two miscarriages, I'm sorry, I cannot treat you now. I have to wait until you have three miscarriages before I can give you progesterone. Well, I wouldn't do that because I feel if I can give it earlier and it stops this pregnancy from being lost, I will give it, especially since I know that it is safe. 
and it is not doing any harm. And I feel that in, my, in that same position with your patient, you will likely choose the same answer. The next one, do you have any comment on giving both oral dufastone and intramuscular hydroxyprogesterone caprate in combination for recurrent miscarriage? Now, I know this is something that a lot of people do anyway. Whenever someone comes in with some bleeding or a previous miscarriage, it's just, oh, let's just give them hydroxyprogesterone caprate. It's something that has been done a lot, but actually has no evidence to back it. And so the answer is, since we don't have strong evidence to say that it works, why give it at all? You may find that that pregnancy continues regardless of whether you gave it or not. So we don't know. And giving both together hydroxyprogesterone caprate and dufastone, which is uh, didrogesterone. Similarly, I don't have the answer for whether it works, but there is concern about oral didrogesterone in the first trimester in terms of cardiac defects. So if you can give vaginal micronized progesterone, which you know is safe, um, instead of giving dufestone or didrogesterone, which you're unsure about, wouldn't you rather give the, the, the treatment which has got known safety? Uh, you'll have to. Okay, the next question is so. The next question is like this. If there is a recurrent miscarriage and um, uterine abnormality, uterine with septation, is there any information showing the result after surgical repair of the uterus? Then you have more pregnancy. Okay. There's, there hasn't been any randomized trials to compare whether those who've been left alone with a uterine scepter or those who have had surgery have better outcomes. So that's why it cannot be routinely um, uh, advocated. But if you were look at um, uterine abnormalities, the principle is that you don't want to compromise the integrity of this uterus. You don't want to remove too much tissue that in fact may make it more difficult for you to get pregnant. Or if you do get pregnant because you've taken up such a big part of the uterus, you're now worried about uterine rupture. So because there's not enough evidence either way, I guess some positions like Figo has, dis uh, has, come, uh, has decided that if you're going to do a minimum surgery with the, um, with the possibility that it may improve outcomes, you can think about it. But certainly there are no guidelines and definitely not enough evidence to say that this is what you must do. So at the end of it, I think the principle should be first do no harm, but if you can do some good, then do it. What's the next question? Uh, the next question is, what is the dose of progesterone for treatment of threatened miscarriage and preterm birth in people with diabetes? In people with diabetes. Uh, Dr. Nhi is answering this question, sorry. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Nhi want to answer one part of this question, and Dr. Shinpa Nambia, you are going to answer the other part of this question. Uh, repeating the question again, what is the dose of progesterone for treatment of threatened miscarriage and preterm birth in people with um, diabetes? Is that dose any different? for women without diabetes? Well, the dose is not different because di uh, progesterone doesn't affect glycemic control. So for threatened miscarriage or even recurrent miscarriage, the dose that was used in the two largest trials, and so we can only use that dosage because that's all the information that we have, is 400 milligrams twice a day. And for recurrent and threatened miscarriage, you start it as soon as the pregnancy is confirmed 
or if at the point at which they start bleeding and continue it up to 16 weeks. And then after 16 weeks, when you've done your cervical length screening, you will give it um, at the dose that uh, Dr. Bamini is going to talk to you about. I totally agree with Professor Shupa Nambia. There's no concern when you use progesterone for women with diabetes. In threatened miscarriage, it is like that. And I totally agree with that for threatened miscarriage and diabetes, we can still use progesterone. There's no concern to stop us from doing that because current evidence telling us that it has no effect on the diabetes status. The next question, can we treat the threatened preterm birth by combining progesterone 200 milligram uh, vaginally together with tyrocool 100 milligram tyrobromide orally? I'm sorry, what's tyropramide? I don't know. This 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 say uh, tyropramide. <laughs> I, I don't know what, what it is for. <laughs> Dr. Ming Yi is asking the, the audience uh, what kind of agent it is. I, I think that we should Google it. Uh, Okay, let's move on to the next questions. What's the next question? Um, the next question go to, okay, in treatment of uh, threatened miscarriage and recurrent miscarriage, oral dirogesterone uh, has been uh, demonstrated to have a higher efficacy than vaginal progesterone. However, oral dirogesterone is associated with congenital heart anomalies. So uh, who should I believe in? What do you mean? Oh, you okay. mean evidence. Well, actually, the evidence for dirogesterone is very poor. It's only two studies in... Uh, uh, in recurrent miscarriage and only one study in threatened miscarriage. And it's not even, um, uh, it was one of them was only one author. There was no details about randomization. So when you quote results from studies that are not validated or are from very small sample groups, and when you are treating a one size fits all, it's very difficult to draw conclusions from that. That's why I said prior to these updates to PRISM and uh, PROMISE, we really haven't had enough information that is consistent to tell us that something works or doesn't work. So I actually, unless there are better trials that have been, that have used didrogesterone in comparison directly with vaginal progesterone, I wouldn't make any conclusions. Um, from this talk, there's only very little that we have gained in terms of information in this year for recurrent and threatened miscarriage. And that's the fact that it works better for those with more miscarriages because we're treating the euploid causes. And there's no study with didrogestrin that gives us that result. Uh, I have a Google tyrobromide. It is an antispasmodic. Yes. Well, there's okay. no evidence to say that uh, this combined with progesterone works better. And the dosage you would want to give them is actually 400 milligrams um, twice a day um, vaginally. There is not even enough evidence to say the oral of the same thing works as well. Okay. 
Kính thưa quý đại biểu, vì thời lượng đại biểu, vì thời lượng hội thảo trực tuyến có hạn, nên ban tổ chức xin ghi nhận các câu hỏi và gửi. Ladies and gentlemen, there is one more question. When we combine, we have a thyrocool, thyrobramide. Is it indicated? It is an antispasmodic agent. We know that currently in the international guidelines and also in Vietnam, nobody mentioned about antispasmodic. Previously, we may have a spasmaverine. Um, Tyrobramide is a, a similar agent. Currently, officially, there's no, nothing mentioned about that kind of combinations. So for threatened preterm labor, you have other tocolytic agents, progesterone, surclage, and pessary, and so on. Ye Regarding the other agents, it might be off-label use. There's another question for me. Patient 38 years old, still birth, recurrent miscarriage four times, antiphospholipid syndrome positive, and there is a hypercoagulability. If they genetic disorders, the need to go to genetic consultation and counselor. And for antiphospholipid syndrome, if you have evidence of both the antigen and antibody, I think that you need to combine aspirin and heparin. I, I think that we may have another lecture another day to talk about this. I, I, would, I would like to have uh, some more input from Dr. Shupa Nambia regarding antiphospholipid. This case has both uh, hypercoagulability and antiphospholipid syndrome. Uh, Dr. Shupa Nambia. Yes. So, well, the reason she's had recurrent miscarriages clearly is because antiphospholipid antibodies are positive. And yes, they are also in a hypercoagulable state, which is why the treatment with aspirin plus uh, low molecular weight heparin seems to improve live birth outcomes. So the way in which you would start it in somebody who is in this um, scenario would be as soon as the pregnancy is confirmed, so like six weeks when there's a fetal heart, you start them on aspirin, um, uh, which is 100 milligrams daily or 150 milligrams if you can, if you have that formulation. And we normally give anoxaparin, which is subcute clexane, and you uh, uh, adjust the dosage according to their body weight. Um, and this is continued all through the pregnancy until you're planning their delivery. So that also treats the hypercoagulopathy part of the thrombophilia and the antiphospholipid syndrome. À, kính thưa các anh chị, thì à, có lẽ là hiện tại thì tới thời điểm này là chúng ta đã là 16 giờ. Ladies and gentlemen, we have exceeded the time limit. We have been sitting here for more than two hours. I know that there might be some burning questions remaining. And many attendants and participants want to share their clinical expertise and experience. However, in the interest of time, we cannot satisfy all the demands. And, uh, that, and uh, there's so many questions to accommodate. I, I think that if you still have uh, other questions and you want to interact with the speakers, Please, I am sure that Basin Healthcare can help us in this aspect. Um, maybe they can do it via email, SMS, a text message, and so on. And the second thing is that 
today we enjoy two lectures relating to recurrent miscarriage, miscarriage, return birth. Currently, we have a lot of scientific evidence demonstrating the role of progesterone for those indications. It is evidence-based medicine and micronized vaginal progesterone is widely used in our clinical practice. And we have seen quite a lot of achievement in using that. I do hope that with the current knowledge, with the lectures delivered by Professor Shipa Nambia and the questions, answers and responses given, we hope that you can have a hands-on and useful clinical knowledge and based on evidence-based medicine to help uh, women with a recurrent miscarriage and uh, return birth, it can enjoy the happiness of um, children with good quality for both mother and child. I'm sure that uh, we have to say goodbye to all of you right now. I do hope that the Basin Healthcare can create and organize a similar virtual forum so that we can meet each other virtually on this platform. It is quite helpful for our clinical practice uh, while waiting until the pandemic is over, or maybe someday we can talk about the pandem pandemic uh, outbreak between Vietnam and Malaysia, what is the current status in Malaysia and so on. Once again, we would like to thank you all for taking time out of your hectic schedule to be here. I wish you a lot of energy, resilience, good health to, to stay awake, to stay alive, and to stay healthy during this pandemic, not only in Vietnam, not only in Ho Chi Minh City, but also neighboring countries like Malaysia. Good health, uh, beauty, and a lot of energy, determination to Dr. Shupa Nambia every to on every healthcare providers regarding the remaining questions i hope that this in healthcare can help us to answer and respond to those questions and sharing clinical experience to on those who have been participating once again good health to you on bye bye thank you very much bye bye goodbye and see you liệu và video thu lại hội thảo bằng cách vào đường link được ban tổ chức gửi đến trong khung chat hoặc quét mã QR code trên You can receive the material or receiving the certificate by going to we are going to give you the ebook Ladies and gentlemen the virtual webinar is going to end here I would like to express sincere gratitude to our two speakers, Dr. Minh Nhi, Dr. Shifa Nambia, and Dr. Tuấn Anh as the interpreter for this meeting. I would like to thank everybody for taking time for attending this virtual seminar. On behalf of Basin Healthcare, I would like to wish you good health and safety and hope to be your trusted companion in the time to come. Thank you. See you again.
Xin cảm ơn tất cả các bác sĩ ạ. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sinh Bá.